What you believe about your health will shape your health. So beliefs actually influence your body. They influence your performance. They influence the way you show up in the world. Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host Seam Lund and today our guest is Vishen Lakiani. With 700 bucks and a beat up laptop, he launched what has become arguably the largest and most successful meditation and wellness media companies on the planet. Vishen is the founder and CEO of Mind Valley, which is an education company that teaches about personal and spiritual growth, business, entrepreneurship and many other topics. That now has a following of 20 million people across 195 countries. But if you believe stress is bad for you, stress will be bad for you. But if you believe stress actually energizes you, gives you drive, stress actually will not be bad for your health. Why does it work? These beliefs, whether they are buried or they are conscious beliefs, are literally creating your reality every single minute of every single day. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's also a hyperactive philanthropist who's on the innovation board of the X Prize, the creator of AFEST, and this very unique perspective, the diversity that it brings, is what has allowed him to question everything and crawl out from under the horde of bullshit rules, what he calls rules, that he believes are holding us all back. Running is not exercise, it is negative exercise. Loneliness and socializing are like very huge predictors of uh, longevity and uh, living well. The first human beings who are gonna live to be a thousand are alive today, and some of them are in their 60s. Is it more like, than like similar to affirmations or sort oh of God, no, or affirmations <laughs> are stupid. Like, don't do affirmations. One and only Vishen Lakiani. Vishen, glad to have you on the podcast. Likewise, Sim, I'm happy to be here. By now, you've written like multiple other books and the newest one, Zero Bullshit Meditation. <laughs> That's a very uh, provocative uh, title and it describes what you have coined to be like the six phase meditation. Yeah, so, so the book is actually called The Six Phase Meditation. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, on Audible, I found it, the, the title was You know zero. why? <laughs> My British publishers, um, wanted a name that would resonate with Brits. Okay. And Brits can be very cynical. And so in Britain, it's called uh, the zero bullshit meditation, but in the rest of the world, it's just called the six phase meditation method. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> but uh, meditation has had a pretty powerful effect on your overall life and uh, well, success me and like billions well. of other people. Yeah, for sure. But we can start with like your story of how did you get into meditation and how has it like, you know, transformed your life? So how I got into meditation was I was working in Silicon Valley and I was going through a really stressful time because when I lived in Silicon Valley, and this kind of give, reveals my age to some degree, but the dot-com bubble had just burst, right? So so many people were losing jobs. I had lost money that I borrowed from my father to start a business. My business was going nowhere. I was just burning through money and eventually I ran out and I was sleeping on a friend's couch. I didn't have money to pay rent. I had to rely on friends to basically support me till I got a job. Fortunately, I had some good friends that I'm so appreciative of even today. Now, during that time, I got the only job that was available and it was this awful job where I had to sell software to lawyers. So I knew nothing about sales. My background is computer engineering and I was struggling. I was Googling online, I was probably looking for help, looking for advice, and I found this class on the Silva Method. Uh, specifically, it was a class called Silva Ultramine. Now, Silva Method, Silva Ultramine, they're two different protocols, but by the same founder, Jose Silva. And he was this mind science pioneer in the 50s, 60s, and 70s who was teaching people how to go into altered states of mind and then use their mind for three things. Tapping into intuition, healing your body, and manifesting goals. Mm. So... And the way they teach it is incredible. You truly master it. So I attended the class and my life changed. Within one week, my sales doubled. I started applying more tactics. Within two weeks, my sales doubled again. Mm. And in four months flat, I got promoted three times and I was made vice president of sales. I was only 26, 27 years old. And I was now leading men who were like 40 years of age yeah. and nobody could understand like how did this this kid just rise up like that so that was my first glimpse of meditation but you see what's interesting there is that people confuse meditation many people think meditation is just stilling your mind and going within no mm. that's mindfulness that's mm. one form of meditation silver method is active meditation and six phase which is the protocol i teach now is also active meditation. It's not about sitting on your butt. It's about applying your mind to go out into the world, 
and shake things up. Start companies, be effective in sales, transform sports, your athletic performance, perform in front of an audience. And that's what I care about. Yeah, that's very interesting. Like, um, I've been practicing different forms of meditation in my life. One of the main ones I tried was a transcendental meditation, TM. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's obviously very popular. It has a lot of, let's say, studies as well, backing it up. And that's more of like a passive form uh, That's passive form meditation. Of observation, right. like you become very still. Like right. the idea is you repeat a mantra and eventually you're completely not repeating anything at all. And you're in like a still piece of, piece of uh, mind. Whereas, like you said, like there's different types of meditation that you can actually use to further creativity or some other kind of goals uh, that you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. So passive meditation has its usage. If you are prone to stress, mm. if you are um, having hypertension, there's numerous studies sh show that passive meditation has a huge benefit on your health. Mm. So there's active meditation. But I prefer active meditation because you don't just get the mind and health benefits, you also gain entrepreneurial and performance benefits. Mm. Is it more like, than like similar to affirmations or like oh auto God, no. or affirmations <laughs> are stupid. Like don't do affirmations. Jose Silvanus research in the 1980s already showed that affirmations were not very useful. Mm. So there is there are techniques of self talk. A better technique is something called lofty questions. Okay, it's by a, a teacher called Christy Marie Sheldon on lofty questions are different from affirmations in this way. So give me an example of an affirmation. I am beautiful and strong and smart. Okay. I, wanna, I wanna make $10 million, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's four different things, okay? So yeah. we're gonna combine research from Jose Silva, Marissa Pierre, and Christine Marie Sheldon to show you how, how you should structure that. Firstly, those are four different things. Mm. Okay, now, don't say I'm beautiful, smart, <laughs> I'm gonna make $10 million. What is the other thing you said? Uh, strong. <laughs> and strong, okay. <laughs> Rather, break all of those four. Mm. So for example, they are 36 or so different qualities I want in my life. One quality is I want to have a great relationship with my kids. So that's one. Another quality is I want to be uh, successful as an entrepreneur. That's another. Another quality is I want my business to be growing by 50% year on year. Mm. Another quality is I want my body to heal and rejuvenate itself as I sleep. These are four different things, right? So if you're doing affirmations, let's look at the last one. My body heals and rejuvenates itself as I sleep. As soon as you say it, there's a part of you that's going to go, no, mm -mm, no, that's not true. <laughs> as soon as you say, I eat healthy, there's going to be a part of you go, no, you liar. You drank <laughs> wine last night. <laughs> so that's the reason why affirmations yeah. often don't work. They actually trigger doubt. Mm. So you want to trick your subconscious. So first, you got to understand this. Our beliefs shape our reality. There's numerous studies on this. What you believe about your health will shape your health. Okay, so there was a study recently that was just published on time it takes to recover uh, from a, a, a wound. So they take people and they make a tiny cut on their hand, tiny cut, a little painful, and then they measure how long it takes for that wound to heal. Now, half the people they put in a room and they it's a normal clock. The other half the people they put in the room and the clock is actually moving 25% faster. Mm. So at the end of 45 minutes, they think one hour has passed. Now, the group that was in the room with the tricky clock that mm. was moving faster, their wounds actually healed faster. Mm. Wow. So this shows that your belief about time affects your rate of healing. Your belief, but it's not your belief about time, it's your belief that, oh my, this wound, the doctor said this wound is gonna disappear in like one hour, this pain is gonna go away. So beliefs actually influence your body, they influence your performance, they influence yeah. the way you show up in the world. There's a book called Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz, he was a plastic surgeon, and what he found is, if he made a tiny change in someone, like a tiny change to their nose that other people don't even notice, they show up in the world, but because they believe they are suddenly more attractive, they're more confident, their income goes up, yeah. they start dating higher quality people, they suddenly find love, everything changes, and he was baffled by it, so he called it psychocybernetics. Tiny shifts in belief have a ripple effect. Okay, so now let's go back to affirmations. The reason people were suggesting affirmations was really to implant beliefs, but because of the negative voice in our head, we spit out the affirmation. So you say, I have a healthy body. And the affirmation goes, no, last night you ate pizza, you fat so. <laughs> we all have that negative voice. Right. I have it, you have it, we all have it. So how do you overcome that to implant a belief straight in your brain? You gotta hack your subconscious. 
And just like a hacker can implant something in your computer, you implant an affirmation in your brain with this concept of turning the affirmation into a question. You say, why does my body heal and rejuvenate itself as I sleep? Mm. Why am I only eating foods which are good for me? Why do I have such an amazing relationship with my children? Okay, now we'll apply another technique. This comes from the hypnotherapist Marissa up here. You amplify it by adding multiple words so it really goes in. Why do I have an amazing, loving, trustful relationship with my children? Mm. Why does my body nurture, heal, and rejuvenate itself as I sleep? Nurture, heal, rejuvenate. Sounds right. similar meanings, but you are stressing that, stressing that, that quality. Mm. Now, when you put it in, your subconscious takes it as a command. There is no negativity. It's as if you're posing a question to your subconscious and your subconscious goes, hmm, why? And now your subconscious will start finding the answer. And as your subconscious starts rolling, you will notice different qualities about yourself. You will certainly start craving healthy foods. You will certainly start noticing you feel more refreshed as you sleep. You will certainly start maybe having a desire to read more books about parenting or maybe being more empathetic towards your child. Mm. But it's not the affirmation. It is hacking your subconscious with a lofty question. Yeah, that's very interesting. I never thought about framing it as a question because yeah, like if you ask a question, then it's like already real and uh, right. you start to like support that uh, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy almost like. Exactly. And the opposite as well, if you have like the negative kind of- Exactly, if you ask your question, why am, why I, am I so shy? <laughs> yeah. why, why am I always falling sick? Right. Those things start happening in your life. This episode is brought to you by Alitura Naturals. Alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging. Regular skincare products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good. Alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in Hawaii. Their products contain zero fillers. The Alitura Night Cream received the 2021 Clean Cert Beauty Awards for Best Face Cream. Alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIM, S-I-I-M, for a 20% discount. So the subconscious mind has such a powerful effect on our, you know, well-being and just uh, success in life. You, we mentioned about how to hack it. So are there any, like, ways to, let's say, make it happen faster? Or, you know, because people are also, like, very, very impatient in terms of, okay, I want to lose the pounds uh, super fast or I want to make the money super fast. I want to right. get the children or the wife super fast. Right. So that, that's the big question, right? How do you get to anything, any goal super fast? That is the essence of the hacker mindset. Mm. If you're a biohacker, you're looking to get incredible health outcomes fastest time possible. And that is where you got to combine two different approaches. Now I call this consciousness engineering. Consciousness engineering is the act of engineering your consciousness so that you get to whatever outcome you want. And there are two pieces you gotta pay attention to. What do I believe and what are my habits? I call these models and systems. So models are your beliefs, your models of reality. Mm. So do you believe, so for example, there was a study that showed that if you believe stress is bad for you, stress will be bad for you. Yeah. But if you believe stress actually energizes you, gives you drive, stress actually will not be bad for your health. Mm. It's incredible. Yeah. Whether you believe something to be good for you or not, you will get that result. Yeah. And it's absolutely fascinating. Beliefs are really powerful. But the second thing is habits. Okay, you want better health. Take on the belief that your body rejuvenates itself as, as, as it sleeps. Take on the belief that you only crave great food. Take on the belief that, so here, here's an example. Take on the belief that I live my life like an athlete and I want to, treat my body like an athlete treats my body. And you can do that through lofty questions. For example, the most important lofty question I ask myself is, why do I have the fit muscular body of an athlete? And when I started asking myself that, I was chubby, I was 22% body fat, and I was so unfit. In one year, I went to 14% body fat, and another year after that, I put on three kilograms of muscle. Mm. That belief literally got me eating healthy, and it got me to exercise. But the belief steers you. The belief, it points you in the right direction, but then you got to move in that direction and that's where habits come in. That's why consciousness engineering is two pieces, right? Mm. Beliefs and habits. And that's where you want to find the best protocols 
that you can do on a regular basis, thus making it a habit that give you the desired outcome. So I read a review of 36 different diets out there. Mm. Keto, by the way, was the last out of 36. Mm -hmm. What is the best food intake approach to get you the results? What is the best exercise approach to get you the results? And this is where people get confused. There's so much marketing out there. So many of the things that we once thought was effective are obsolete or not effective. Keto is not the most effective diet for you. Running is not exercise. It is negative exercise, according to Doug McGuff. And so you got to know exactly what is the best approach that you can install as a habit. Yeah, and obviously it comes down to knowing that thyself as well. Or like different diets work for different people. And uh, in yeah. some ways, yes. Yeah. But the more interesting thing is not this. It's not that different diets work for different people. It's that what you believe works for you will to some degree work for you. It's called mm. the placebo effect, <laughs> yeah. right? So there was a study done on maids um, at, a, at a hotel. So the psychologist played a trick on these maids. They pretended that they were doing a work survey and they would speak to these maids and they would ask these maids, so how many uh, hours are you spending changing bed sheets? What, how many stairs do you think you climb every day? And then at the end of the study, they would say one little word. They would say, wow, Matilda, based on what you're telling me, you're getting so much exercise every single day, you must be really fit. Hmm. One month later, the maids who had heard that comment, with no additional exercise, they, they lost weight. Hmm. Their heart biomarkers got better. Their health improved, simply because in their mind, they started believing that what they were doing was exercise. Yeah, that's super powerful. I know about that study as well. <laughs> and yeah, like the beliefs are just something that, guide our like decisions all the time. And right. But again, you also got to look at, at the habits, right? Mm, for sure. So for example, one of the things I recently did a video that got, I think now 8 million views. And I say running is useless. Mm -hmm. And I got so <laughs> many comments saying, how dare you say running is useless? I run every day. I love running. <laughs> well, look, there's a book called Body by Science, which is one of the most important books of the last um, couple of decades on the science of exercise, right? And the medical doctor behind this book, Doug McGuff, literally says this. He says the definition of exercise is, are you creating a positive, a metabolic, or mechanical shift in your body? So building muscle, improving your heart rate, um, burning, burning fat, and are you doing it in a way where you're not prone to injury? Then he goes on to say, running is negative exercise. Not only is he saying it's useless, he's saying it's bad for you. He says 60% of runners in any given year is, have an injury. Mm. That itself means it, it's not effective. And running causes an injury on average, based on a scientific study, for every 100 hours, there's one injury. Mm. So if you're running an hour every day for 100 days, you're gonna get injured statistically. But he goes on to say that running is also bad exercise because when you get to your 40s and 50s, people who run frequently experience pains in their knees, and they also experience pains in their shoulders because of the shoulder movement during mm. running. And running also causes you to burn off type two muscle fiber, which means what you really want in your body to be fit is to put on muscle. Muscle has the highest correlation with, with, with longevity. This has been multiple studies. Uh, Peter Diamandis just announced this, the, the great futurist. You wanna live longer? Number one thing you can do, build muscle. So you need to go to the gym, do high intensity interval training, whether you're a man or a woman, right? If you are jogging rather than doing um, exercises that build muscle, you're actually losing muscle. Mm. And many people who run lose muscle. So people who say, okay, running vision, I don't believe you, running is, 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 is legitimate exercise, stand at the closing line of a marathon and observe the body shape of the people passing through. And then stand at the closing line of say, um, a type of race that does full body motion. For example, Spartan race. Spartan race of all the races has the highest correlation with overall athletic ability. Mm. Spartan race, you gotta climb, you gotta lose your muscles, you gotta crawl, you gotta lift heavy objects. Spartan races have great bodies, runners do not. Because runners have burnt their muscle. And so when you burn off your muscle, your metabolic, your basal metabolic rate goes down. Now you need to keep running to burn mm. fat. If you're not running and doing high intensity interval training, you're building up muscle and you start burning more fat anyway because muscle burns more fat. Mm. And of course, you also live longer. You don't get the knee pains. You don't get, get the shoulder joint pains. Right. That's why running is useless. Yeah, I mean, 
I say I would say like exclusively doing only running is probably very or it's not going to be the most effective way of right. promoting longevity. You need exactly. Both. You yet, need both. And yet kind of that is what a lot of, of people do. Tens of millions of people exclusively mm. run. Yeah. Like the one that, OK, I'm going to start to exercise. The first thing they do is run. Exactly. <laughs> it's the low, lowest bar barrier to entry and also like the kind of easiest, mo most right. like. So, so what is the most effective exercise um, based on what I've read? And of course, you know, there may be new scientific studies coming out, but high intensity interval training. Mm. Anything that can build muscle in the most rapid, effective way possible. Yeah. There's different uh, methods to achieve that. Like the, the book Dog, Body by Science talks about this super intense, like right. once a week or something like that, uh, exactly. 12 minutes of exercise. <laughs> Whereas there's, you know, this regular weightlifting, there's blood flow restriction training, like there's a lot of exactly. different methods right. to achieve that. But yeah, you're right, muscle is super important. Uh, for longevity. And for men and women, mm. women don't get this. So many women clients um, uh, of Mind Valley are afraid to do any form of weight training because they say, oh, it's going to make me bulky. I don't want a female bodybuilder's body. Mm. You're not going to get that unless you are really, really, really working out for hours every day yeah. because women simply don't have the biochemistry that men do. But women also need to build muscle and it's the most effective exercise for women. Yeah. I like to call it the slow motion train wreck because like it's going to take years to build muscle and right. it's not going to happen overnight. So if you start lifting weights, it's going to be like a slow motion train wreck. You can see it coming. Right. It's going to take two years before you hit it. So you can change. You can stop lifting. Exactly. And, and also your body is naturally losing 1% of your yeah. musculature every year. It's called sarcopenia. Mm. Right. And so you want to. Uh, you want to bring that back. Now, in studies, do you know how long it takes to recover from that 1% muscle loss a year? How many hours of weight training? Um, well, at least like for the elderly people, they would need at least like 45 minutes twice a week or something at, at least. Right. 45 minutes twice a week. But if you do this for one month of the year or even mm. two weeks of the year, you recover that 1%. Mm. So in other words, oh. my father... I tell my, my father, Dad, I know you don't like going to the gym, but you're 75. Sarcopenia is going to cause your muscles to, to, to rapidly degrade. You need to go to the gym at least four times a year for 30 minutes to neutralize sarcopenia. And if you go more, you're going to put on more muscle. Mm. That's how easy it is to build muscle when you first start out, and then you hit a plateau. Right, right, yeah. The beginner gains are right. very, very big. Uh, Let's take a step back to the meditation. Right. So six, Somehow we really got off meditation, yeah. didn't we? <laughs> six phases of meditation. What are they? And Okay, uh, yeah. so, so I like to approach everything from the perspective of this. How do I get the best results in the shortest amount of time? Now, when I do this about meditation, people are like, I don't like you. I don't like that. Because meditation, you're, you're trying to make turn meditation into a productivity practice. Mm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because our time is limited. And my six-phase meditation is not designed for people who are hermits, who have no job. It's designed for busy entrepreneurs. Some of the world's top performers talk about the six-phase meditation. I've trained Hollywood A-listers, uh, athletes uh, have spoken about it. If you look at my Instagram, you'll see I have interviews with Reggie Jackson of the LA Clippers who spoke about the six-phase meditation. I have an interview with Bianca Andrescu. She beat Serena Williams and won the US Open. She credited the approach, the wow. visualization protocols in the six-phase meditation. So it's for people who are performers, entrepreneurs, athletes, even pop stars. There's an article in Billboard magazine about how the R&B star Miguel does the six-phase meditation before his concerts, does mm -hmm. it with this entire team. So what is it? Well, you want to get optimal results in as little time possible. So I looked at what are the qualities that we want to nurture in ourselves for us to be optimal human beings, not just for ourselves, but for the people around us. And what is the most effective methodology to get to that quality? Now, the six qualities of the six phase are kindness and compassion. We want to train ourselves to be more compassion, compassionate. When you have more compassion in you, not only are you making the world better for other people, but you perceive other people as being kinder back to you. And therefore, you feel more like you belong. You feel more connected to your society, to your city, to your community, to your family. Now, the second phase is gratitude. Studies on gratitude show that gratitude is the human characteristic with the highest correlation to well-being. Mm. The third is peace, and peace comes from the practice of forgiveness. I learned this at Dave Asprey's biohacking facility, 40 years of Zen. Dave Asprey, of course, the godfather of biohacking. Forgiveness means forgiving yourself for mistakes and forgiving other people. And studies show that when you practice forgiveness, 
your health improves, your your heart health improves, back pain disappears, depression goes down, you sleep better. Mm. Some studies even show that your endurance goes up, your vertical jump goes up, it's insane. Mm. Forgiveness is a powerful approach. So these are the first three phases and they all have to do with what I call present state emotion. That means emotions that we experience in the now. Mm. However, the great myth of meditation is that it's all about the now. No, it's not. If you're all about the now, how are you going to build a future? You see, there's this mistaken belief about spiritual masters. Ken Wilber, the academic philosopher says, the great spiritual sages and mystics of the world were not feeble-minded milk toasts. They were movers and shakers who rattled the world with the force of their ambition, from conquering entire continents to bullwhips in the temple. They created revolutions that lasted centuries. And what he was saying is that Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, they were not passive. Mm. No, they were revolutionaries. They went out there and they kicked butt. The great spiritual teachers were more Bruce Lee than the passive meditator. Mm. They could channel the spiritual forces within them, but they were also human. They embraced human desires and they went out there to build, to create, to conquer, not in a bad way, but to improve the qualities of humanity. Because when you truly get spiritual, you start feeling deeply connected with everyone. Jesus brought a bullwhip to the temple because he was you know, against the money changers, but he was also kind and compassionate. So the mistake people make is they look only at present state emotion. No, you gotta look at future emotion. You gotta have an awareness of the future you wanna create, and you gotta go out there and create that future. And that's where phase four, five, and six come in. Mm. So phase four is looking at your life three years out and declaring how you want your life to unfold. Phase five is saying, okay, these are my goals three years out. What am I gonna to do today? And it's seeing your perfect day, the actions you're gonna take, the, the stuff you're gonna do at work, the calls you're gonna make. And phase six is very simple. It's where we integrate the sixth phase with whatever is your religious belief. You simply ask for a blessing from God. You would say, God, universe, whatever you believe, I have sent out compassion to the world. I've expressed gratitude for all the gifts you've given me. I have forgiven my enemies, forgiven myself. I've shown a three-year vision of how I want my life to unfold. I've declared how I'm gonna to operate today. Would you bless me? And that's phase six. Mm. When you stack it all together with the specific protocol, so each phase takes about two to three minutes and I bring in science-based protocols, how to visualize your future, how to practice gratitude, how to master forgiveness. I bring in these science-based protocols, so it's super fast. When you do it together, it's approximately 18 to 20 minutes, but mm. you see an incredible improvement in your life. So it's like you first set the uh, emotional feeling of, you know, kind of warm, warm fuzzy right. feeling for yourself, and then you let go of the bondages, <laughs> being the forgiveness part. And then you go and out then, to yeah. conquer your future. Then you vision, visualize the, like, okay, that's where I'm going, and then you're... Right. And you know, many people talk about manifesting. This is one of the most powerful manifesting tools. Mm. I do it every day. Sometimes I may combine it with other meditations. If I wake up late, I might do it in my, um, my Uber ride or in the subway, but it's very easy to do. Mm, gotcha. Is there any like other rules that... Well, do it, it? it goes deep. There's a whole book on it and you can go super, super, super deep in it. Mm. Once you understand the six phases, for every phase, there are different nuances, different ways, there are different levels to go really deep in every phase. Mm. I mean, these phases are big things, like mastering compassion means that you truly become your ultimate loving self. You truly are accepting of every human being. Other people's BS cannot phase you. Mastering gratitude means you have mastered happiness. Even in moments of crazy, chaotic chaos, you know how to refine your bliss. Mastering forgiveness is really interesting. The writer philosopher Neil Donald Walsh said, the master doesn't need to forgive for the master understands. Mm. You become so powerful in who you are, you develop a state that I call being unfuckwithable. Nothing anyone does to you, no negativity can touch you. You mm. just shake it off. And again, there are ways to get there. When you master creative visualization, you become a manifesting master. Literally the thoughts in your head just cause the reality to bend to bring you there. When you get to phase five, which is your perfect day, you're super organized. You know the right actions to take every day. You're unshakable in your pursuit of the perfect day and of getting what you need to get done, done. 
When you master phase six, you feel so connected to a higher power, you never feel alone, and mm. you feel always supported and connected. Mm. But again, the path to mastery can take years. And so there are different nuances, different protocols that you bring in to get to this mastery. I remember trying, I don't know if it was the same six phase meditation, but like six years ago or something, I read it from your book, the first right. book, The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, which had similar stages yeah. of meditation. I don't, I don't think it was the same, but uh, I, I practiced it and I and indeed noticed that, okay, in the morning you feel like this warm, fuzzy feeling after doing the meditation because of the lovi right. lovingness and gratitude and those kind of things. And also just having like this, you know, good sense of direction yeah. and purpose and, okay, these are the things I need to do. And after the meditation, you just have more like, I don't know, like not willpower, but more like energy to, okay. Well, everything, everything. Yeah. And there's scientific studies on this. so. There's a book by Daniel Goleman, Professor Daniel Goleman, called Altered Traits. And there's this beautiful graph in this book that fascinated me, and it shows that science research on meditation has been growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. Between 2010 and 2020, it was an exponential curve. So people who say, oh, meditation, I don't get it, it's fluffy, they're making two things. Firstly, they're not updated on the science. Right? Mm -hmm. The science started really blowing up in 2010. And secondly, they, they are confusing active and passive meditation. These are people who are go-getters who think that meditation is all about being passive, sitting on your butt, not doing anything, and that's not them. Mm. But no, the meditation I'm talking about is about going out there and shaking up the world. Yeah, the quote, like, if you feel like you don't have 20 minutes to meditate, then you need, like, right. two hours to meditate. Yeah. So that's true. Yeah. So, like, just squeezing it in, like, the 20 minutes is going to give you, like, more productive time back. Exactly. Exactly. The productivity gains on this one are huge. I saw one of your talks on your YouTube channel, the Mind Valley YouTube channel, about these different techniques as well to f like facilitate creativity, like using like the like you know like the examples like Thomas Edison or someone like that. They did. They were about to fall asleep, and right. then that's kind of very similar. That's intuition. Yeah. That's a whole other aspect of being human, and it's something else that you can train. So in regards to the meditation, this obviously has a lot of this spiritual baggage as well that people like to associate it with. But like you said, there's so many scientific studies about the benefits of meditation. Exactly. So what is happening in the brain, and like what, what does it, why does it work? To be honest, we don't know. <laughs> we can see the results of why it works, but we really don't know why meditation works. We don't know. There are, there are certain things that they are seeing. So meditation and longevity, okay? So one of the, the biomarkers that determines longevity is telomere length. Telomere are a little like ends of your, your chromosomes. Mm. And telomeres get shorter and shorter as you age. They found that people who meditate, their telomeres actually don't shorten as fast. In short, meditation is contributing to longer living. Mm. And another thing that they found is that meditation has huge impact on heart health. People who meditate, their heart, heart is so much better. And there are some things that science just can't explain. Practicing things such as forgiveness improves your vertical jump. Mm. After I shared that, an Olympian basketball player reached out to me. He's like, how can I master forgiveness? <laughs> But we don't know why. How is it right. that practicing forgiveness causes your body to be able to jump higher? We don't know. So there are these weird things. But the best thing we can understand is that there's a huge correlation between our mind and our body. Our mind literally is actively creating our reality and influencing the state of our body. You know one of the most crazy studies I, I, I read about? So get this, okay? It's a study on your mind impacting your body. So the New York Times carried this article about this medical doctor called Dr. J.B. Mosley. And he worked at a veterans hospital in the United States. Veterans are ex-soldiers. And he wanted to help men who were ex-soldiers heal really painful arthritis of the knee. Now, back then, he knew about this concept called placebo, but, he, but most people thought placebos can only help you with headaches and so on. He wanted to see if the placebo could substitute surgery. So mm -hmm. he did this crazy experiment. He brought 10 men who had knee arthritis and eight of them, he didn't actually operate on the knee. Two mm. got the real operation. Eight, they put the men under anesthesia. They made some cuts on the knee. They bandaged it up. So when the men woke up, they could see stitchings. They could see bandage. They could see a little bit of blood and they thought, oh wow, I just had the surgery. Of these 10 men, can you guess how many of them recovered from knee arthritis? Remember, eight got a fake surgery. How many? I would like 60%? 100%. Every <laughs> wow. single patient.
recovered from knee arthritis. Mm. It wasn't the knee. It wasn't the surgery. It was their belief that a doctor had given them an intervention. Mm. So Unbelievable. In short, their mind had literally changed the reality of their body. So what does this tell you about your mind and your body? It is so powerful what our minds are doing to our body. Meditation is a way of controlling this incredible energy. And this energy is not just conscious. This energy, a large chunk of it is buried. It is your subconscious. It is beliefs that you took on as a child, beliefs that maybe came from your childlike mind trying to understand the world, beliefs that maybe came from a traumatic experience, but these beliefs stay buried. We don't even know we have these beliefs, but these beliefs are like code, mm. programming our human computer on how to function in the world. Mm. And these beliefs, whether they are buried or they are conscious beliefs, are literally creating your reality every single minute of every single day. Yeah, I, re I remember this Instagram reel. I saw that a girl was walking a horse, but you know the horse is used to having the collar around his uh, face. Right. But the girl didn't have the collar. He just faked like putting something around the horse, and then like invisible rope right. carried the and the horse followed her like because he right. it thought it had put the collar on. <laughs> That's an interesting analogy. Yeah. The invisible rope. Yeah. All of us have invisible ropes holding us back. Invisible mm. ropes. In, that are tying us to certain attachments that we shouldn't have. And these invisible ropes are literally keeping us locked in an existing reality. I'm currently reading a book called Conversations with God with Neil Donald Walsh. And Neil talks about manifesting. He says, we are all gods experiencing the world. And we are here as souls having a human experience mm. to literally play with our ability to create reality. But why is it that most of us are unsuccessful? It's because of these invisible ropes. We are tied to our history. We are tied right. to our trauma. We are tied to our beliefs, even if they are bullshit. But if you could simply forget th that stuff, that's why forgiveness is such a powerful practice, and then choose the new reality, you would literally see your life change so fast. Mm. But he says, you gotta choose, you gotta decide, and you gotta stop flip-flopping. Mm. Decide on one thing. He says, one, the other reason we don't re manifest is because we're constantly flip-flopping. You decide right. one thing, you know, maybe I want to meet the, the man or woman of my dreams. Then you go, well, maybe I don't want to be like tied down like that. Decide one thing. And as you make that decision, your reality starts molding. Mm. And we are literally gods playing with a godlike power to bend reality when you understand how powerful your mind is. Mm. Yeah, in the health space, there are some studies where just the physical, let's say, perception of your appearance uh, determines like or affects your biological age scores as well. Exactly. So, so the people who from the mirror, they see, OK, I look older than they also have worse scores <laughs> exactly. based on the bi biological age tests. So it's like very powerful. And if you're like, I'm 40 years old, I can't exercise anymore. I can't, you know, lift stuff anymore. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy again. If you believe that 50 is old, 50 will be old. Mm. If you believe that old is only when you hit 100, yeah. you're gonna have a long, healthy life. Your beliefs influence your longevity to a striking degree. Yeah, and, and most of it comes from, because we look at our like grandparents and parents. Exactly. Like, they go down the hill, but I mean, in the, this decade, we're gonna have so many new medical breakthroughs that kind of change the paradigm uh, yeah. completely. Peter Diamandis said, the first human beings who are gonna live to be a thousand are alive today. Mm. And some of them are in their 60s. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's very, obviously we need to like wait and see, but it's obviously, if you look at like things uh, evolving, technology and all those other things, then the same applies to like medicine as well. That... Right, right. It's growing exponentially. So let's take a, like a turn to your personal routines. Now you run multiple businesses, you're traveling the world all the time. So what's your like stable daily routine that you try to follow to stay healthy and successful? Well, the first thing I want to say is in the last 10 years, because of my dedication to discovering the best practices, the best habits, I've interviewed over a thousand people. I've been able to increase my productivity per hour worked tenfold. That means what I do in six minutes now used to take me 60 minutes before. But it's not just productivity tools. It's the way I train my mind and my energy. 
and my 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 spiritual energy, my ability to manifest. So here's how I structure my day. So firstly, I always track my sleep, and I try to ensure I get my optimal sleep, which is seven hours forty five minutes. It's slightly longer if I have an extensive uh, gym workout that day, mm. but seven hours forty five minutes. As soon as I wake up, I go and I have this weird desire to torture myself by taking a cold shower. So I live in Estonia, where the water is extremely cold during the winter. I turn on a cold shower and I just scream. <laughs> and then I feel so good. Cold showers cause a huge spike in dopamine that lasts us throughout the day. And I find that I'm so much more focused and productive after a cold shower. I then sit in bed and I do the six phase meditation that takes me about 20 minutes. I then go and I make a unique type of coffee that's 60% decaf, 40% caffeine, because I want just a little bit of caffeine, but I don't want to get hooked on it. Yeah. I then dive into my work and I do about four hours of back-to-back -back meetings with my team. After I'm done with meetings, I then come out of my fasting state. So I try to fast for 14 to 16 hours a day. So I'd stop eating at say 10, 10 p.m., right? And then I eat, break my fast, eat breakfast at 2 p.m. It's called intermittent fasting. And it has an incredible effect on your, your metabolic states and your body and your health and even your clarity of thinking. So at 2 p.m., that's when I'm making my four egg omelet because since I work out, I need a large dose of protein. Four eggs are approximately 48, 48 grams of protein. Mm. And then I take a nap. I literally will give myself permission to take a nap no more than 15 minutes. There were studies on napping by NASA that showed that naps can boost your productivity by about 30%. I come out of my nap, I go back into work, and then um, I may take breaks to exercise. And then I do something that's really important to me. At 6 p.m. every day, I spend an hour learning. People forget this. So I'm a CEO, so I spend an hour learning how to be a better CEO. Maybe it's taking a course on AI. Maybe it's taking a course on presentation skills or communication. An hour every day, I seek to learn. And then after 7.30 p.m., I close work and I don't go back to work. After 7.30 p.m., it's time for family and for friends and for reading and study, um, curling up with a good book or watching a Netflix movie or um, enjoying wine with a, with a friend and then going to bed. Now, in between that day, I also have other practices. I'm a big believer in supplements, so I take a unique set of supplements in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night before going to sleep. And that's like every day you're... Yes, so that's, that's my routine when I'm stable. I also travel a lot, and when I travel a lot, I give myself permission to adjust and try other routines. Mm, yeah, a lot of the, I don't know, self-help, let's say advice is to have like very long morning routine, almost like several hours. No, hours. that's nonsense. Yeah. I don't, my morning routine is literally 30 minutes. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, if you wanna do that several hour thing, fine. But I love my work so much, I wanna dive straight in. Yeah. After about, but I still have a cold shower and uh, practice meditation. Yeah, exactly, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. Like I do, I do the cold shower, I grab a tea or something and I'm, I'm off to work because I just love it so much. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, are the weekends off or do you like every day? No, I, I, I typically work two to four hours on the weekends, but mm -hmm. weekends are for enjoying life, for travel and for my kids. Mm. Yeah, like one of those things I've appreciated a lot from your content as well is like just the importance of family and uh, friends. Right. <laughs> because like that's in the longevity space, it's like often very like overlooked. But if you look at the studies, then loneliness and and socializing are like very huge predictors of uh, longevity and right. living well. Yeah, I'm proud to say I'm an extremely good friend. Like I'm <laughs> one of those friends that that is like super loyal. Um, nice. I have maybe 200 friends in the world, 200 people I consider friends, nice. and I'm constantly in touch with them. And in fact, 100 of them come visit me every summer in Estonia. Mm. In the mind 100 of the 200. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I mean, friends are hard to come by and especially if you're both like living longer then it's like yeah. you have, I don't know, four decades of <laughs> shared yeah. experiences and those kind of things. Oh, well, there are some like future projects that you're working on right now. So I, I believe the most important way to think about future projects, I, I, I follow this discipline, which I learned from actually how Google operates as a company. Every year I set maybe 10 goals. 50% of my goals should have a 50% chance of failure. Mm. So what this means is five goals, easy. I know I'm gonna hit them, right? But the other five goals, any one of them 
I have a 50% chance of failing. And if I fail, that's okay. But if I don't have a 50% chance of failing, then it means I'm thinking too small. Mm. So my rule for myself is 50% of my goals must have a 50% chance of failure, which means at the end of the year, I will I should only achieve 70 to 80% of my goals. Now I trickle this down to my entire team. My entire team follows the same methodology. And when you do this, you actually f con get people to think in a completely different way. Firstly, people can now dream bold. So I have to force myself to dream big. People can now be very bold and if they fail, it's okay. Mm. It's not a problem. You are expected to fail in 25% roughly of all of the goals that you set for. So my goal is to live a life where every year I have at least anywhere from five to 10 projects that really excite me, but half of which have a 50% chance of failure. Mm. Yeah, that's aim, like, well, what was the saying? Like aim for the stars or aim for the stars and perhaps you'll still land on the moon. Something yeah, like that. Something like that. Yeah. So it's the idea is that if you let go of the leash, so to say, or like shoot past the invisible leash, then uh, you're, you'll right. like overcome some of the limiting beliefs. Exactly. And when you set goals like that, you are forcing yourself to have to learn and grow. Gotcha. Well, this has been amazing. And uh, yeah, looking forward to Thank all you. the Thank future you, projects. Where can people find you? Mindvalley.com or on Instagram at Vision, V-I-S-H-E-N. Awesome. We'll put the links in the show notes. Thanks. But do you want to achieve and maintain biological youth? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to add healthy years to their life. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details.